to spend some time talking about is ministry to each other. Ministry that we have for the body of Christ, for each other. At the heart of all ministry is love. And what's interesting about it, love, is that we don't have the capacity in ourselves to do it. We don't, we don't have the capacity to love in ourselves. That's, that's why six out of 10 marriages end in divorce. It's because they're trying to operate out of self. That's why you have broken homes, broken families, brokenness, is because what's happening is individuals are trying to um, work through their own stuff and they keep slamming up against a wall. The reality is we don't have the ability to love unless we're enabled to do so by God. Anything else? I, I, I might start out okay in my own strength, but I can guarantee you somebody is going to say something to me, do something to me, act towards me in such a way that it's going to upset me, it's going to hurt me, it's going to do so. And now I no longer have love toward them. The unfortunate thing is that's not the definition of love the way we think. Let's look at um, scripture here. John 13, 34, and 35. A new command I give you, love one another, period. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Love one another, period. There are no conditions. There's no... If this person does what I want, and if this person makes me feel a certain way, and if this person lines up with my thinking and my desires, and if this person sees things the way I see them, and if this person never hurts me, then I'll love them. Well, doesn't say that. The only condition here is as I have loved you, Jesus is saying, so now you love others. Well, what, what was the condition under which Jesus loved us? It was unconditional. There were no conditions attached to his love for us. So if there were no conditions attached to his love for us, then there can't be any conditions attached from, to our love for someone else for others. There is nothing more difficult in life than to love somebody. This is, this is the most difficult thing in life. The most difficult thing in life. There are six words that, that define the different aspects of love. And we in our Western culture, the tendency is when we think about love, what we're really thinking is how we feel. Now, there's a, there's a word for that defines love as a feeling. That's not what this is talking about. This, this God kind of love has nothing to do with what you feel. It has nothing to do with what you feel. And so if we say we love God, 
but don't love each other, we're liars. Now, here's, here's the interesting thing. We all can grow in this area. We all can grow, and, and, a, and a lot of us need to grow a lot in this area. Let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians. If I speak, this is the, the message Brittany gave. If I speak in tongues of men of angels or of angels, but do, do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to the poor and give over my body to the hardship that I may, I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So if I have a gift that's tremendous in terms of my speaking, and I don't have love, then it's just noise. If I can have faith that does tremendous things, but don't have love, the Bible says, I am nothing. Wow, that's pretty profound. I am nothing. And if I tithe and give offering and give all my possessions over to the poor, it profits me nothing. It gains me nothing because I don't have love in my heart. And so love is a gut check. It's a, it's a motivation check. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Am I doing what I'm doing because I'm expecting reciprocity? Am I doing something because I, I want to get something back? You know, here's the interesting thing. None of us, none of us want to be hurt. None of us want to be taken advantage of. But here's the reality. You will be hurt and you will be taken advantage of. And that is not a reason not to love. That's not a reason to get closed up and, and shrink back and uh, hate the world and hate everybody around me and be mean to folks because you've been hurt. That's not a reason. Now, there's some things you've got to work through, and there's probably some things you've got to work through with those other people, but it's not a reason not to love. There is no excuse for not loving others because Jesus didn't have one with us. And he could have, right? Remember, remember when he caught the woman in adultery? Caught her, the Bible says, in the very act of adultery. And he said to everybody who was standing around, anybody who's without sin, cast the first stone. Well, they started dropping their stones, and they got out of dodge. And then he says, well, who's left to stone you? She says, well, nobody. And he says, I won't either, because if there's anybody who could have stoned her, it would have been him, because he was without sin. He chooses not to stone her. He chooses to distribute the Father's love to her. And then he says to her, go and sin no more, right? Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is not a license to sin. It is the enablement to live righteously. It's the enablement to live righteously. It's not the license to sin. So if, if Jesus, who was perfect, who was sinless, can love all of us, certainly we have a responsibility to do the same. And look, we got to get out of ourselves we got to get out of ourselves because it is self that, pre that prevents us from loving others. It's self. I don't like that person. I don't like that person. That person. Hey, girl, I don't like you. God, God sees it all. 
We're, we're not getting away with anything. He sees it all. He knows it all. He knows the depths of our hearts. He knows our intentions and our motivations. Let's go on in this. Um, verse 4. This, this is what love is, the God kind of love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Right? We, we all know this because this is the, the marriage scripture. But, you know, here's the thing. This isn't just for married people. This is for all of us and how we treat each other. Brothers to sisters, sisters to uncles, uncles to nieces, fathers to daughters, sons to mothers, right? It's for everybody. This is how God is expecting us to love each other. This is how God is expecting us to love each other. Love is love. Uh, is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Let me just read that part again. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. Love does. Verse 8, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will all pass away. Love never fails. There is this part of us that has to get over our stuff. Because it is our stuff that prevents the love of God for, for having place. It is bitterness. It is resentment. It is um, hurt, pain. It's all the stuff that uh, either we've brought on ourselves in our life or that other people have done to us. There's things that people have done to us uh, uh, apart from what we've done to ourselves because of our, our own poor judgment. There are things that have happened to us. And uh, even in those cases, I can't blame somebody else for not loving. I got to go to God and say, God, heal whatever that is that's in me that's preventing me from loving others. Because when we don't love others, here's what happens. We actually diminish ourselves. We think it's the strength that we have, but it actually diminishes us. We, we, we think, oh, I'm going to be cool. I'm going to be bad. I don't really care about them. Well, here's the thing. You've, you've just diminished yourself by not loving others. Let's look at Romans. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. The word, the word honor there, it, it, it has to do with value. It has to do with weight. 
um, in ancient times, you know, when they had, they had money, they had coins. The heavier the coin, the more valuable the coin. So the scripture says, give weight, give honor, give value to others more than yourself. See, we, we live in a world where we say, be the best, do the best, you're the best, you're the best, you're the best, you're the best. And here's the thing, we actually start believing that. If I'm the best, then you can't be the best. You got to be the least. That's not, that's not the kingdom of God. That's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God says, because you are one and you are only one, and there will never be another like you, you can be the best. And guess what? So can I, and so can you, and so can you, because there's only one of us. So I don't have to compete with you to be the best. I'm already the best because God only made one of me. There's not like 15 of me running around that I'm trying to compete with. There's just one. So I am the best me God has made. You are the best you God has made. And therefore, there is honor that's afforded to you. See, we ought to celebrate and we ought to honor who God made you to be, not stumble over who you're not. See, we look at a person and be like, well, she's not that, and she's not that, and she's not that, and she this, and she that, and he that, and he, right? And, and we all can look at each other, and we can stumble over lots and lots and lots of stuff that's in our life. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see the stuff that's in our life. But God is saying, look, rise above that and honor them for who they are. Celebrate who they are. Don't stumble over who they're not. That means I have to look at you differently. The Bible says, uh, judge no man after the flesh. So I, I can't look at your life and, and, and judge you and based on all the poor decisions you've made and say you're nothing and discard you. I got to honor you. See, it's a, it's a, it's a completely different perspective on, on how we need to view each other as opposed to how the world views each other. See, in the world, I give you honor based on what you can do for me. You can't do anything for me, yeah, later for you. But in the kingdom, everybody gets honor. Everybody deserves honor. Doesn't matter where you come from. Don't matter what, what side of the tracks you're from. Doesn't matter if you're black, white, green, or purple, male, female. None of that matters. You deserve honor. And it's our responsibility to afford it to every person liberally. Liberally. Matthew 10. Anyone who receives you receives me. This is Jesus talking. He's talking to his disciples. Anyone who receives you receives me. Anyone who receives me receives the Father who sent me. If you receive a prophet as one who speaks for God, for God you will be given the same reward as a prophet. And if you receive righteous people because of their righteousness, you will be given a reward like theirs. Hmm. Here's the interesting thing. When I honor you, I actually can get 
what you have. When I, when I give you honor, I can get what you have. Who, whoever receives a prophet can get the reward of a prophet. Whoever receives righteous people can get the reward of a righteous people. I, I can actually get what you have. Because I've honored you. I've lifted you up. I've given you value. So it opens, it opens something in me to be able to receive what you have given me because I value what you've given me. Do you see what I'm saying? When, when I open myself up to, to be given something from you and I honor you, that that you have, I can get. Part of the reason we walk around the way we walk around is because we're not open to each other. We're not open to, if you, if, if, if you have something that can help me, then I should be open to you to help me. No, nah, I don't want to get it from you. I'd rather get it from that person. Well, that person doesn't have what you need. That person does. This is, a, this is an interesting example. About three weeks ago, I was washing Tony's car, and I've got this tar on the bottom of the car. At first, I didn't know what it was. I just thought it was just some gunk that I could spray something on and get it off. But it was actually tar, so it's raised on the car, and it is not coming off. It is not coming off. So now I'm mad because it's all along the bottom of the car. And I'm like, OK, so I must have drove down a street that had this tar on it, and it wasn't closed off. They must have did something in the street and then just left the street the way it was. And I drove down it, and I got all this stuff on my car. And, and now it's like horrible. So I'm, I'm sitting on the, on the ground trying to get it off. And, and here's, 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 here's what the Holy Spirit said to me. What would Clint do? Uh, this is the truth. What would Clint do? Because he has shown me lots and lots and lots and lots of things about how to take care of a vehicle. Holy Spirit said, what would Clint do? And about... Eight and a half seconds later, the Holy Spirit said, clay bar. I'm like, so I go in my, my, my shed, and I get clay bar, and I start taking the clay and start wiping the car. And guess what? It started coming off. It started coming off. Now, it took some elbow grease, elbow grease, and probably an hour and a half later, it was all off. But I was getting upset. I was getting frustrated. But then the Holy Spirit says, you received something from somebody. You, you are open to letting somebody teach you about something. So now you have their thinking about this. Do you see? So because uh, I was open to be taught something, I could now have access to what they had access to. This is why you give honor to people, because you can actually get what they have. You can get their mindset. You can get their perspective. We have to be open to each other. We have to be loving to each other. We shouldn't be trying to manipulate each other. That's what the world will do. The world will try to manipulate you. But if, if, we're, if we're loving one another, we should be open to what they have. Now, you know what they say about opinions. Like, everybody's got one. Now, this, it takes discernment. It, it takes some discernment. But we should be trying to build each other up, not tear each other down. It takes no effort to tear each other down. None. 
We can rip each other to shreds. We can, we can go up one side and down the other and rip each other to shreds. It takes no effort to do that. We can talk about all of the bad stuff that's happening in our lives. No discernment to do that. But can I encourage you in love when you're going through your worst situation? Can I forgive you when you've done something to me that's hurtful? Because this is what God says. He says, look, love as I've loved you. Look at 1 Corinthians. Verse 12 it says, The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. The human body has many parts, not just one part. So it is with the body of Christ. We have many parts to our body. Do you realize that the way God um, made our bodies, that our bodies have the ability to heal itself? Okay. So the body of Christ has the ability to heal itself. Yeah, it has, the, it has the ability to heal itself. And the way it heals itself is through other people. So when we get a cut or an infection, you have cells that rush to that cut that begins to work on um, clotting the blood, uh, fighting the infection. They come from another part of the body to that, to that particular place where it's injured and does work to bring healing to that part of the body where that infection is. Well, so true is, 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 is us. We have the ability to work together where there is some brokenness, where there is an infection, and heal that part of the body. But, but what we have to do is we have to realize what we have to give in order for the healing to manifest. Let me go back to verse 7. It says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. In the class, they're actually going to spend a lot more time talking about this. A spiritual gift is given to each one of us so that we can help each other. So what I have actually isn't for me. It's for you. What you have actually isn't for you, it's for everybody else. I was reading a, a story of a, a young guy who had the gift of healing, but was in the hospital for three weeks with an intestinal uh, disorder. And, um, you know, he had done miraculous healings with people all over the world. And someone asked him, uh, well, if you've got this gift of healing, why have you been in the hospital for three weeks? And he says, the gift isn't for me. The, the gift is for everybody else. I have to trust God, and I have to use the word of God for my healing. I, I, I can't use it on myself. It's for everybody else. And so we have to understand that what God has given us, it's to use, it's to support, it's to bring healing and, 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 and mending for the rest of the body. And then let's look at um, verse 18. But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part 
just where he wants it. We're many parts, but God has put each part where he wants it. In other words, God is saying, the gift that you have and where I've positioned you is exactly what I want for you. We live in, we live in a world where we say, I want what they have. I, I, don't, I don't really want my gift. I want their gift. My, my, my gift hasn't done anything for me. Well, that's part of the problem. It's not for you. So we minimize what God has given us, and we look for other things to get because that seems to be more interesting as opposed to working with what God has given us and based on the position that God has given us, how he's positioned us in the body, being able to position ourselves in excellence in that way. We disregard. We disregard. So I don't, if it's not this or that, then I don't really want anything else. And the very thing that God has given you is the very thing that's going to release and set the captives free. Because that's what God has given you. Here's the interesting thing. Lots, a lot of our experiences, a lot of what we've gone through in life has a relationship to the gifting that God has given us. And we actually, if we can trust God, if we can love God, if we can let God strengthen us, all the things that, that God meant, I mean, that Satan meant to destroy us, actually becomes a springboard for God to advance us and to work in the body. Remember Joseph. Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery. Then uh, when he went to Potiphar's house, he was sent to prison. And later on, when he becomes second in command to Egypt, he says this, what Satan meant for evil to destroy me, God meant for my good and to, to bring salvation to, to millions of people. And so we have to think about, okay, God, all of this stuff that's in my life that I've been through, you actually want to use to uh, springboard me, to catapult me, so that others that I come into contact with might be blessed. Yep, that's exactly what I want to do. There, there are no wasted experiences. You hear me say that all the time. There are no wasted experiences in the kingdom. God wants to use that experience that you've gone through, all of those horrible experiences that you've gone through, to receive comfort from those and now comfort someone else. Part of the problem is we don't want anybody else to know what we've been through. Okay, but it's, it's that thing that God is saying, I'm going to actually surround you with people like you so that what you've been through can be a support to them. Ephesians 4, verse 11 it says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. There's, there's lots of gifts besides the ones that I'm reading here. And they'll talk about that in the class. Um, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. The role of the apostles, prophets, 
pastors, teachers, evangelists, is to equip you to do the work to build up the church. It's to equip you to do the work that will build up the church. So guess what? There are no spectators. There are no spectators. Because God is saying, your job is to build up the church based on the gifting that you have and what you're being taught. God is expecting that you're learning and what you're learning, you are going to use to edify and build up the church. There is no, there is no spectator in the kingdom. There is no spectator in the church. I know we'd like to be able to just like come to church and then just leave and not have relationships with people. But the reality is what God is expecting is that we learn and in our learning, we actually use what we learn to help others so that they might mature too. So that the whole body is built up as opposed to one, two, three, four, or five people built up. The whole body is built up. That means there is a, there's an there's a, there's a energy and an effort and an expectation that, that we all should have to, to learn, mature, because someone else's maturity is based on mine. Someone else's maturity is based on mine. Someone else's breakthrough is based on mine. See, in the family of God, there is no every man for him or herself. I have a responsibility to mature in God so that I can help you. The Bible talks about the blind leading the blind. Well, guess what? But this is Jesus saying, they both end up in the ditch. <laughs> we, we have to come to a place and we have to have our own responsibility to mature in God so that we can help others mature in God. That's how it works. That's, that's how it works. That's what a lot of this is all about. There's, there is, there's, it's not okay to be babes in Christ forever. That's not cool. That's not cool. You got to grow up and you should have an expectation of yourself that you're going to grow up. Because the rest of the body needs you to grow up. I mean, this isn't the most popular word in the world. But can you imagine? <laughs> imagine this. I'm the only adult, and I had a room full of two-year-olds. I, I hate to even picture that. There has to be enough people that are mature to help those who are coming into maturity. You have a responsibility to become mature. It's not my responsibility. That's not my, my, my responsibility isn't for you to be mature. That's yours. My responsibility is to equip you, right? We all got our responsibilities. Now, I have to believe that, okay, Lord, 
as you're equipping me, you're going to orient me such, in such a way that my gifting can be used to be a blessing to the rest of the body. Yep, that's exactly what I'm going to do, Kevin. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Here's the beautiful thing. As we give away what God has given us, guess what happens? We get more. So as I pour out onto others what God has given me, God pours into me even more. Well, what if I don't know my gifting? Then here's what I would say. Serve. Serve. Do something. I got a lot of stuff for people to do. Come and see me. To serve. Right? You heard the, you heard the, this, the, the uh, saying before, you, you can't really steer a parked car. Right? You, it's got to get in motion before you start, like, making it go somewhere and do something. Acts 2. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and prayer. They devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to that. What are you devoted to? What are you devoted to? They devoted themselves to teaching, to fellowshipping, to helping each other to prayer. We had a prayer this morning at 10:40 at 9:45. We had a class this morning, right? These things go on and on and on. What are you devoted to? He says that they devoted themselves to these things. There is a devotion that we must have, must have to God and to each other. I can't have a devotion to God and not have a devotion to my brother and sister. That is a lie. Jesus says this to Peter after Peter denies him three times. He says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Tend my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? The third time he's like, Lord, you know all things. Yes, feed my sheep. His love for the Lord had to have a manifestation toward the people. Our love for God must be manifest toward people. It must be manifest toward people. It has to be manifest toward people. It's got to manifest towards people. There is no uh, having a devotion to the Lord and not toward people. That doesn't work. It doesn't work in the kingdom. If we love him, then I have a responsibility to love you and to help you, help you be everything that God intended you to be. That's my responsibility. I can't shirk my responsibility. We all will give an account. We all will give an account to say, okay, Kevin, I gave you this gift. Let's see how well you used your gift. Mm, not so good. Mm, not so good. Mm, okay, not so good. Mm, not so good. So I sent you to earth. I gave you a gift, 
so that you might bring hope and health to many, and you shirk your responsibility. You get to come into the kingdom because of grace, but rather than having the big mansion on the hill, which is what I had for you, you can get the two-bedroom apartment. Because it's about rewards. See, we, we all get to heaven, but what we get when we get to heaven is based on what we do on earth. It's based on our rewards and based on what we do. I have a responsibility to you. You have a responsibility to me and the person sitting next to you. Somewhere, somewhere, somebody lied and said, the pastor has more responsibility than the people in the chairs. Somebody told that lie somewhere because it's not in the Bible. Not in the Bible. You have the same responsibility to everybody here that I have. It's different, but you have a responsibility to them. So God is going to think about, he's going he's to judge, how am I using my time? Am I being devoted? Go back to that scripture, Acts. Mercedes, did she? Uh, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those being saved. The result of coming together, meeting together, sharing your possessions, helping each other, taking care of each other, making sure if people had something that was in need, they would give it. The result of all of that was God added to their body because the body was healthy. Wherever there's a healthy body, there can be things added to the body. Not only corporately, but individually. See, this, 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 not only, this, isn't, this isn't just for uh, the church as a whole, but this is for you individually. Individually, you benefit when the overall church is healthy. We benefit when the church is healthy. When the church isn't healthy, we don't benefit. Love is at the center of it all. When, my, when I told my mother and father that I was getting married, I was 23. Like, what did I know at 23? Like, what was I thinking? Yep, I'm getting married. My dad asked me one question. Do you love her? I said, yeah. He's like, good, because you're going to spend the rest of your life proving it. I didn't get it at the time. I get it now. I get it now. If we think that it's going to be easy, Get over yourself. Listen, listen, listen. I don't think on that Friday afternoon, Jesus was excited about going to the cross. Hey, everybody, guess what? I'm getting crucified today. 
they're going to stick a spike through that hand, and they're going to stick a spike through that hand, and they're going to stick a spike through my feet. Yes, I can't wait. And this is what love is all about. It's about crucifying the flesh. Because God didn't ask him, hey, Jesus, you feel like going to the cross? Do you feel like it? Well, Lord, you know, I don't really want to go to church this morning. I don't really feel like it. He didn't feel like it. He didn't feel like climbing up on that cross. Here's what the scripture says. It says, for the joy set before him, he was able to endure the cross. The joy that he saw was the the sons and daughters that God would have in right relationship with the Father. That's the joy. He could see something beyond his own feelings. And that's at the center of our love for one another. That's the thing that propels us every single day. The love that we have for God has to manifest towards people every day. Let's stand.